Hey guys, welcome back to my channel for another Serial Killer Spotlight video. This is the third in the series. I've already covered Jeffrey Dahmer and Eileen Warnos, so if you want to go check those out, they'll be linked down below. As you can probably tell from the title, this month we're covering Richard Ramirez, who I personally think is probably one of the scariest serial killers of all time. Of course, that's a very subjective statement, but there's just something about the way that Ramirez committed his crimes. There was no rhyme or reason to them. He was so, so violent. I mean, if you look at Jeffrey Dahmer, he actually hated the killing part. Not that it makes it any better, of course, but he didn't enjoy killing. He just wanted to create these human zombies, somebody who would be with him forever. Eileen Warnos killed because she believed these men were trying to hurt her. So she says, Ramirez killed because he wanted to. But if you look at Ramirez's childhood, it's pretty much the perfect recipe for how to create a serial killer. Everything he was taught when he was young, he used in his later crimes. Ramirez's killing spree lasted from June 1984 to August 1985, and he was attacking people at an alarming pace. He was actually convicted of the murders of 14 people. Most of these happened just between March 1985 and August 1985, 12 of them in about five or six months. And of course he didn't just murder, he raped and tortured dozens of other people as well and he was eventually caught on the 30th of August 1985. He was born in El Paso, Texas on the 26th of February 1960 to his Hispanic parents Julian and Mercedes Ramirez. He was known as Richie to most of his friends and family throughout his life but I'm just going to refer to him as Richard because I think that's more formal. His father was a railway worker and he was known to be abusive and violent throughout of all of Richard's childhood. He would beat him regularly and so as Richard got older he would take any opportunity he could to leave the house. He'd even go and like sleep in graveyards just so he wasn't in the house being beaten up by his father. This violence proved to be a family trait. Richard's older brothers also were prone to violent outbursts and as you can probably guess so was Richard. As a child, Richard actually suffered two pretty severe head injuries, which a lot of people say may have attributed to his later crimes, to his mindset. And this is actually something that you see quite a lot in serial killers. There's quite a few serial killers I can think of off, off the top of my head that did suffer with head injuries as a child. As the first injury happened when he was two years old, a dresser fell on top of him. He fell unconscious for about 15 minutes and required a few stitches in his head. And the next one comes when he was about five years old and he is kicked in the head. I don't know if it was actually by somebody on a swing or was just hit in the head with a swing. Um, but again, he falls unconscious for a little bit. And then a year later, when he's six years old, he starts to suffer from epileptic fits, which they actually said was due to these head injuries. He suffered with temporal lobe epilepsy. And so as a child, he would get these fits really quite regularly, but he sort of grew out of them by the time he hit his early teens. Richard was the youngest of five children. He had three older brothers and one older sister, and they were a working class family. They didn't have that much money. All five of the children suffered from different medical problems growing up from respiratory diseases to Collier's disease. They all had something wrong with them. And obviously Richard had his epilepsy. And this is actually because they lived in El Paso. Just the next day over in New Mexico, throughout the 1950s, the US government were testing nuclear bombs. And so the fallout from these bombs would get blown over by the wind and would settle in and around El Paso, meaning that it wasn't just the Ramirez children that had medical issues. Pretty much all of the children in Richard's class had some kind of problem. Nuclear fallout is no joke and it made a lot of people in that area very, very ill. So they were working class, they were ill, they were struggling to pay their medical bills and it was just a never ending cycle. In 1959, while she was pregnant with Richard, Mercedes, his mum, also worked in a factory where she was dealing with a lot of strong chemicals on a day-to-day -day basis, and it was the 50s, so of course there wasn't any protective gear. A lot of people wonder if this maybe had an effect on how Richard's brain grew. When Richard was 12 years old, his cousin Miguel, who was known as Mike to all of his friends and family, comes into the picture. Mike was a US Army veteran, he'd spent a lot of years in Vietnam, and he was sort of a decorated war hero. People thought that he was a really, really brave man, but he wasn't. He was a really, really messed up guy. He obviously suffered with PTSD after coming back from the war, but even whilst he was over in Vietnam, he committed some pretty atrocious crimes. Mike would show 12 year old Richard pictures that he kept in a shoebox on top of his wardrobe. And inside the shoebox, Mike kept Polaroid pictures documenting the abuse that he would commit on these Vietnamese girls. He would force them to commit sex acts on him and then he would murder them. And these pictures literally showed him murdering these girls. There's one picture where he's even standing there 
holding the dismembered head of one of these girls and Richard was seeing this at 12 years old and Mike was showing off like it was something to be proud of so at no point did Richard ever think like oh this is really really wrong he was intrigued by it because Mike was showing it off Richard and Mike were pretty much inseparable. They'd drive around the neighborhood together smoking weed and Mike would tell Richard all of his stories from the war. And he would even tell him how to kill people, how to kill with stealth, the most effective ways to do it. Even telling him the best way to slit someone's throat so they die quickly. Richard was a young boy on the edge of puberty being told all of these stories and finding himself excited by them. So he started to associate violence with sex. When Richard's 13 years old, he's around Mike's house one day and Mike's wife was a woman named Jessie. So Jessie starts talking to Mike about how Mike needs to get a job, that he's sort of sitting around doing nothing all day, they need money, and it sort of turns into an argument. So Mike turns around, opens the fridge and gets his gun. Not sure why he kept his gun in the fridge, but he did. And he just turns around and shoots his wife in the head in front of Richard and their two kids. Mike turns around and tells Richard to go home and not mention it to anyone and so Richard does. He goes home and he doesn't utter a word. He is not affected by this in the slightest. And of course Mike is arrested when all the neighbours hear the commotion and call the police on him. Jessie doesn't die immediately but she does die later on in hospital. Later that evening or the next day depending on which source you believe, Julian, Richard's father, says that he needs to go around to Mike's house and just sort some things out because of course Jessie's now dead, Mike's in prison so they need to sort out the house. And Richard says that he'll go along with him. And Richard says that he wanted to go because he wanted to see the aftermath. He wanted to see what had happened in the house. He said that he was just so intensely fascinated by it. It didn't bother him. He just wanted to see it. Mike obviously goes to trial for his wife's murder and actually is found not guilty by reason of insanity. In court, they talk about his PTSD and talk about all the sacrifices he made in the war. And so he's found not guilty and just sent to a mental hospital for four years. He's released in 1977. And once he's released, his influence over Richard continues. At this point, Richard's 17, 18 years old. But just jumping back to 13 year old Richard for a little bit. So back to 1973, shortly after he's witnessed Mike kill Jesse, his parents sent him to visit his brother Reuben in Los Angeles where he's just moved to. He's not in LA for too long, but whilst he's there, he starts to really get into pornography and his brother teaches him how to break into people's houses. He teaches him how to pick locks, open windows and disable alarms. Later that year, Richard actually moves in with his older sister Ruth and her husband Roberto. And Roberto is a peeping Tom. He loves to just go and watch women in their houses. And so he starts to take Richard along with him on these journeys, teaching him the best way to spy without being seen. So at this point, you've got a 13 year old Richard whose mother worked with chemicals whilst she was pregnant with him. He suffered two pretty serious head injuries when he was younger. He's beaten by his father, spending nights in graveyards. He is exposed to violence at a really young age by Mike. He's taught to kill by Mike. His brother is teaching him how to break into people's houses. You've got his brother-in-law teaching him how to spy on people. Did he ever stand a chance of not being a serial killer? He is taught everything he needs to know by the age of 13. Around this time as well, he's about 14, he starts experimenting with stronger drugs. He's already doing weed, he has been smoking weed for a few years, but he's doing LSD, cocaine, hallucinogens, anything that he can get his hands on. And this is something that continues throughout his life, he's always quite a big druggie. He also starts to get an interest in Satanism. Now he was brought up in a very strongly Catholic family and he just decides to go against this and he believes that Satan is the more accepting deity and so he starts to worship him. It was kind of the ultimate fuck you to his family and the way he was brought up and his belief in Satan only was solidified when Jesse's mum actually puts a curse on Richard's father Julian and Julian ends up spending about two months bed bound. Richard always attributed Satan to a lot of his actions and when he was 18 he even ended up driving all the way to San Francisco to meet Anton LaVey who was the author of the Titanic Bible. So by the age of 17 Richard's already a bit of a criminal, he's just doing like petty crimes, he's stealing, he's breaking into cars, things like that but he's actually sent to the Texas youth camp for juvenile delinquents. And then again, a few years later, he's arrested for drug possession and this just keeps going throughout his life. Once he's out of his juvenile delinquent camp, he actually gets a job at the Holiday Inn. 
And at the Holiday Inn, he would steal people's pass keys, break into their rooms and steal things. But he found that this just wasn't really enough for him. So what he started to do was he would hide in people's rooms, like trying not to be seen. And then when they were asleep, he would sneak around the room, steal all their things and then sneak out. It was like a challenge to himself. He wanted to see if he could hide and have nobody have a clue that he's there. And he was good at it. However, one night he decides to go that one step further and he sneaks into a room and ties up a woman and tries to rape her. And just as he's about to actually do it, her husband comes into the room and he sees what's going on and absolutely beats the crap out of Richard, like so, so badly. And of course, after this, Richard does lose his job. I and mean, the couple do press charges to begin with and then they actually decide to drop it all because they don't want to come back to the state. They don't want to ever come back to Texas and relive what they had to go to. They just don't want to have to go through all of the pain of a court case. And so all of the charges against Richard are dropped. By the February of 1978, so he's 18 years old, he is completely estranged from his family. He has completely let himself go as well. His personal hygiene is pretty much non-existent. And due to his really poor diet and his heavy drug use, his teeth are literally rotting in his mouth. This is something that a lot of people would later say about the Night Stalker. They would say that his teeth were disgusting and his breath was the worst thing they've ever smelt and this started when he was really, really young. He moved to Los Angeles. Over the next couple of years, he's committing a lot of thefts, he's stealing cars, he's arrested a lot of time for drug possession and breaking and entering. So he is very much on the radar of the police and they've got a lot of files on him. On April 10th, 1984, Richard commits his first murder, although it wasn't attributed to him until 2009, so long after everything else. When it first happened, they found DNA at the crime scene, but didn't have the technology to actually test it. But in 2009, they decide to actually properly test it and it strikes a match with Richard Ramirez. But there was actually some other DNA at the scene and they did find out who it was it did strike a match but they've never said who it was because they were actually a minor at the time and this is something people have always wondered about the night stalker's crimes did he always act alone or did he have somebody with him and it shows at this particular crime his very first murder it is likely that there was somebody with him this first murder was of nine-year-old may lung she was found in the basement of her apartment building hanging from a pipe she was playing with her brother in the building when she realises that she's lost a one dollar note and so goes off to look for it. And later on when her brother actually goes to look for her, he's the one who discovers her body. So, so, so young. She was raped and beaten before being stabbed to death and her body was hung from the pipe. Richard was known to be living within six blocks of this building at the time. Two months later, so on June 29th, he commits his second murder. This is of 79 year old Jenny Vincow. Now she's asleep in her bed in her apartment in Los Angeles and she is repeatedly stabbed while she's asleep. Her throat is slashed so deeply that she's pretty much decapitated. Like it was really, really deep. And Richard actually used the technique on Jenny that Mike had taught him all those years earlier. He broke in through an open window and he was later connected to this crime through his fingerprints on the screen. Um, he actually had sex with her corpse and Jenny's body was really sadly discovered by her son the next day. Can you imagine walking in on that? You'll notice this is a theme throughout all of Richard's murders. He likes to go for people who can't defend themselves really. He goes for the elderly and the disabled most often. Now his next murder doesn't happen for nine months. Of course there could have been other killings within this time but he's never been attributed to any and nine months is just a huge huge amount of time and after this next murder which happened in March of 1985 he just can't stop, like they just keep coming. He kills 12 people in the next five or six months. So this is the 17th of March, 1985, and he creeps up behind a woman outside a condo in Rosemead, Los Angeles. And this is Maria Hernandez. He's creeping up behind her and she sort of senses something. So she turns around and sees him standing there with a gun pointing at her face. He doesn't say anything and he shoots and she subconsciously raises her hand to her face while she's got her keys in it and the bullet hits the keys and ricochets off. Of course, from the force of it, she falls to the ground, but Richard obviously thinks she's injured and so just sort of like walks around her and into the condo. Maria's pretty much uninjured, so gets up and runs towards the alleyway at the front of the house. And as she's doing so, she hears another gunshot from inside. This is her roommate, Dale Okazaki. So Dale's heard all of the commotion from outside, so she is hiding in the kitchen. She's hiding behind the counter and when it goes quiet, 
she lifts her head up over the top and Richard sees her and shoots her once in the forehead, immediately killing her. Richard then leaves the house and spots Maria hiding behind a car and Maria says to him like, please don't shoot me. And he doesn't, he just walks away. And this is particularly strange because this murder clearly didn't satiate him that night because he immediately goes on to murder someone else. He attacks again in Monterey Park. He pulls 30 year old Sai Lan Yu, who was also known as Veronica, out of her car and into the road. And while she's lying in the road, he just shoots her multiple times. And then he just flees the scene. And obviously there's a lot of people around, they all run to help Veronica. But by the time she gets to hospital, she's sadly pronounced dead. Around this time, the media coverage begins. And of course, nobody knew at this point what it was going to turn into. Nobody thought they had a serial killer on their hands. But as more and more crimes happened, more people were describing the same man. Tall, with a gaunt, caved-in face, dark, dark eyes, and long, black, curly hair with rotten teeth. Over the next couple of months, the media dubbed him a whole variety of names. Some of them are really awful for a serial killer. There's the walking killer, the valley intruder, which he's sometimes still known as. There was even the screen door killer, and it wasn't actually probably until August, beginning of August, end of July, that the name Night Stalker actually stuck. And I'm just gonna say a quick side note here because I know I'll probably get a few people in the comments asking. Obviously, no, this isn't the original Night Stalker, the Golden State Killer. And the original Night Stalker actually did most of his crimes in the decade earlier, although in a very similar area. And he was actually still active at this time. Um, obviously, he was recently arrested, Joseph D'Angelo. And a lot of people keep asking me to cover his case. I totally, totally intend to do his case. It's such an interesting one. Um, but I'm gonna wait until after the trial to do so because I think I'll be able to give you some like more information then. Um, so yeah, original Night Stalker, Golden State Killer will be coming up, just be patient with me on that. Anyway, back to our Night Stalker here, Ramirez. So after these murders, he really starts to pick up the pace. He's murdering more and more. It seems that he can't bring himself to stop. And he's probably actually being egged on by the media coverage at this point because he wants that attention. On the 27th of March, he enters a home in Whittier. They'd actually robbed a year before and he enters about 2 a.m. and kills sleeping 64-year-old Vincent Zazara. His wife, Maxine, is lying next to him in bed. She's 44 years old. Richard ties her up and beats her and demands to know where they keep all of their valuables and then he just ransacks the house looking for everything. However, whilst he's doing so, she actually manages to escape her bonds and she reaches under the bed for a shotgun as she tries to shoot him, but it's not loaded. And this infuriates him. It makes him so, so angry. And so he kills her immediately with his gun and then takes a carving knife from their own kitchen and just mutilates the body. He stabs her all over. He carves what looks like a T in her left breast. And then he gouges her eyes out, puts them in her own jewelry box and takes it with him. At this scene, Richard leaves the first piece of like tangible evidence. He leaves a shoe print in the flower beds and this was actually a shoe print from an avia trainer. And of course the police photograph it and take a cast of it. They were also able to match the bullets at the scene, 22 caliber bullets, two bullets found at the other scenes as well. Around this point, they're starting to realize that they have a serial offender on their hands and a multi-county operation kicks in. Like all of the police are working together on this only Richard goes quiet. The next attack doesn't happen until the 14th of March when he returns to Monterey Park and enters the home of 66 year old Bill Doy and his 56 year old disabled wife Lillian. He shoots Bill in the face and beats him unconscious before going into Lillian's bedroom where he puts thumb cuffs on her and rapes her before ransacking the house. Bill later dies of his injuries in hospital but Lillian survives and then on the 29th of May he enters the home of 83-year-old Mabel Bell and her 80-year-old disabled sister, Nettie Lang. And he beats both of them with a hammer that he finds in their own kitchen. Most often, he would use weapons he found in the victim's own home. He would bring his own gun with him, wouldn't always use it. Um, he'd also try and use binds that he'd find in people's homes. Like if he found rope or if he'd find ties, he'd use them. It was actually a bit strange that he bought his own thumb cuffs to the attack on Lillian. He uses electrical cord to shock Mabel and then ties up Nettie and rapes her and then uses her own lipstick to draw a pentagram on her thigh. I'm convinced that he only added the satanic element to his murders just to further all that media attention. 
he loved to read about himself in the newspapers and as soon as he started adding like satanic symbols and stuff all of the coverage just blew up. The two sisters actually managed to survive the attack and they're not found until four days later by their gardener. However, Mabel actually later dies in hospital in July from complications from her injuries. The next day, he drives to the house of 42-year-old Carol Kyle. Now, he's always driving stolen cars throughout his entire spree. He probably uses about five or six different cars. So he breaks into Carol's house and binds her and her 11 year old son. And he then rapes Carol and puts her son in the wardrobe. He eventually leaves and doesn't end up killing either of them. Um, on the 27th of June, 32 year old Patty Higgins is killed in her home, her throat slashed. And then less than two miles from Patty's home, 77 year old Mary Cannon is killed on the 2nd of July. He bludgeons her with a lamp while she's still in bed and then repeatedly stabs her to death with a 10 inch knife be found in her own kitchen. On July 5th, he breaks into a home in Sierra Madre and bludgeons 16 year old Whitney Bennett with a tire iron as she sleeps. And he actually searches around the entire house for a knife but can't find one. So instead he attempts to strangle her with a telephone cord. Now as he's doing so, he actually sees sparks flying from the cord and this really, really freaks him out because he thinks it's a message from Jesus. Now I feel I need to clarify something here in terms of Satanism. There's very much two separate branches of Satanism and obviously I'm not a huge expert here so if anybody knows anything more and I'm wrong, please correct me down below. Um, but from what I've been researching, there's two sort of different branches, main branches. One is that you believe in Satan as an actual entity and so through your belief in Satan, you also do kind of believe in Jesus and God. You just believe in Satan and his message more. And then there's what's called the Levian branch of Satanism in which you don't actually believe in Satan or God or Jesus or any kind of like actual entity. The Levian Satanism branch is more similar to atheism but it's all about self-indulgence so doing the things that make you feel good. It's about being selfish and giving in to all of your sort of like dark desires. Obviously that's in a nutshell I could go into it a lot more than that but obviously Richard very much idolised Anton LaVey so he definitely sort of believed in the Levian Satanism but he was raised as a Catholic and so it was ingrained in him that Jesus and God and Satan were real and so he was sort of like this weird amalgamation of the two. As far as Satan is concerned I, I believe in a, in a malevolent being. Uh, his description eludes me but I, I have felt powers that are evil. He's always said that he believed that Satan told him to commit a lot of these murders. He did a lot of this to make Satan proud of him. So I know if I didn't clarify that a little bit I'd probably get comments down below so I figured I would just say something about it. But um, back to Whitney. Um, so Richard sees these sparks and flees the scene but he actually leaves the tire iron lying on Whitney's bed and he also leaves a bloody footprint. Whitney somehow miraculously managed to survive the beating, but she required 478 stitches and has required constant cosmetic surgery throughout her life to sort of correct the damage. On July 7th, he beats 67 year old Joyce Nelson to death in her sleep. And he leaves an almost perfect shoe print from an avia trainer on her face. That single murder didn't quite satisfy him that night and so he returns to Monterey Park and breaks into the home of 63 year old Sophie Dickman. He handcuffs her at gunpoint and fails to rape her but he does try to and then he ransacks her house for jewellery and makes her swear to Satan that there's nothing left of value. On July 20th he buys a machete and then drives in a stolen Toyota to Glendale. He breaks into the home of elderly couple Layla and Maxon Needing and he hacks them in their bed with a machete and then kills them with shots to the head. He robs their house of all valuables before further mutilating their bodies, just because, and then he heads straight out to sell all of the goods that he's stolen. Now, from everything I could read, it doesn't look like Richard had a job at this point, so his pretty much full-time job was burglary and murder. He would steal from these houses and then sell the goods and that is how he was making a living. That same night after he goes out and sells all the goods, he drives to Sun Valley and this is around 4 a.m. He breaks into the house of China Rong Covenant who he murders with a single shot to the head. He rapes and beats his wife Somkid as well as beating their eight-year-old son and then he steals an estimated $30,000 worth of jewellery from the house. 
August 6th, he drives to Northridge and breaks into the home of Chris and Virginia Peterson. He shoots Virginia in the face with a handgun and then shoots Chris in the temple. However, Chris fights back, this shot doesn't kill him. And miraculously, both of them manage to survive their injuries. On August 8th, he breaks into the home of the Abawaths and kills the husband Elias in his sleep and then handcuffs and beats his wife Sakina before raping her. He repeatedly makes her swear on Satan not to scream and as this is going on, the three-year-old son hears what's going on and he enters the room. Later that same day, the police announce to the public that they've got a serial killer on the hands. It's the first time they've actually like publicly said the words. They say that he's responsible for six murders, although of course by this point it was more, they just hadn't made the links. Um, and they said that he was particularly scary because he had no solid MO, they had no idea where he was going to turn up next. The only common theme is that he would break into people's homes and ransack it, he wouldn't always rape and he wouldn't always murder, so you never knew what you were going to get with him. It's around this point that the media finally dub him the Night Stalker and obviously due to this public announcement, calls to 911 increased by 15% that weekend because people are just terrified and gun sales skyrocket. So Richard, knowing the heat's on him a little bit, travels up to San Francisco and whilst he's there he breaks into the home of Peter and Barbara Pan. Yep, Peter Pan. Um, and he shoots Peter in the temple while he sleeps and then beats and abuses Barbara before shooting her and actually she survives. At the crime scene, Richard uses Barbara's lipstick to draw on the wall. He draws a pentagram and writes the phrase, Jack the Knife. It doesn't take the San Francisco police long to connect this murder to the murders that are happening down in Los Angeles. And the mayor of San Francisco, who is Diane Feinstein, actually goes on TV and does a press conference making a speech about the Night Stalker. She basically, on TV, lists all of the evidence that the police have got against him. She says that they know what gun he uses, that they know what shoes he wears. And Richard is obviously sat probably in a hotel room watching this. And he says that he literally saw this, picked up his shoes, walked to the middle of the Golden Gate Bridge and just dropped them off. Diane Feinstein ruined all of the work the police had done. The police had purposely been keeping quiet about what evidence they had against him because they were slowly building a case but now they were back to square one. And they knew this, as soon as the police heard Diane's announcement on TV, one officer famously says, well, there goes the gun into the bay. Although strangely enough, Richard didn't drop his gun into the bay, he only dropped his shoes in there. So he was still holding on to that gun. Luckily, a huge break in the case comes on August 24th, and believe me, they get lucky with this. So Richard travels 50 miles south of LA to Mission Vejo, where he arrives at the home of James Romero Jr. And they've actually just got back from holiday, so the family are still awake, it's quite late at night at this point. And the family's son, James Romero III, hears some noise outside. So he goes into his parents' room and says to them, like, I think somebody's trying to break into the house. And Richard sees that everyone's awake, there's lights turning on, there's commotion inside, and so he just flees. And James Romero III, who was 13 years old, runs out of the house and takes note of the car. It was an orange Toyota, and he even makes note of a partial number plate. Obviously they don't immediately assume it's the Night Stalker, they just think it's somebody trying their luck and trying to break in, but James Romero Jr. calls the police and tells them what they had. After this close encounter, Richard breaks into the home of Bill Carnes and Inez Erickson and they are engaged, and he shoots Bill in the head and rapes Inez, demanding to know where she keeps her money. He also forced her to declare her love for Satan. And before he leaves, after he's ransacked the house, he actually tells Inez to tell them that the Night Stalker was here. Them either means the media or the police. He's getting cocky, he's thriving off all of the media attention, not knowing that the whole case is about to unravel. Bill manages to survive this attack. Inez unties herself and runs to a neighbour's house and he has to have two bullets removed from his head, but does survive. Inez was able to give the police a very, very detailed description of her attacker and it matched all of the rest of the descriptions people have been giving. Tall, gaunt, dark eyes, long curly hair and disgusting teeth. And amazingly, she also managed to catch sight of the car that he was driving, an orange Toyota. And the police immediately linked this to the sighting earlier in the night, only this time they had a partial number plate. A few days later, they find the car abandoned in Wilshire Center, Los Angeles, and Richard had obviously abandoned it and wiped down the entire car, but he hadn't wiped it down properly. He'd left 
one single fingerprint on the rear view mirror. They run it through the system and it strikes a match. Richard Ramirez, who was described as a 25 year old drifter from Texas. And yeah, you heard that right. At this point, Richard was only 25 years old. It's easy to assume that he would have been a lot older. In reality, he's one year older than me. On the 31st of August, the authorities make the decision to release Richard's 1984 mugshot for a car theft. This mugshot was actually from December of 1984, so we'd already committed two murders by this point. So they released that to the media, and by the morning, Richard's face is on every single newspaper across California. And after a very depressing video, this next part of the story is a beautiful example of the public coming together to help everyone. So on the 30th of August, Richard, not knowing that the police are on his tail, boards a bus to Tucson, Arizona. Now this was a seven to seven and a half hour bus ride and he's going there to visit his brother. So he arrives there sort of late at night on the 30th and realizes that his brother isn't home. And so not really knowing what to do, he just boards a bus back to LA, another seven, seven and a half hours. So in total, we spent 14 hours on buses to Tucson, Arizona, not knowing that the police are searching for him. His bus arrives back at LA's Greyhound bus station at around 7.30 a.m. that morning, and the entire station is crawling with the police, and Richard spots this almost immediately. And he doesn't know that they're there for him, but knows that he probably shouldn't be seen. And so he just slips out of the back entrance and walks down the driveway that all the buses came up. You see, the police weren't looking for people getting off the buses. They were expecting Ramirez to try and flee the city. They were looking at people getting on the buses, not knowing that Richard just happened to take a day trip out to Arizona. So Richard walks into East LA where he enters a convenience store and this is where he spots his face staring back at him from the front page of every single newspaper. And like as he spots this, he sees a group of elderly Hispanic women and they're all whispering to each other, El Matador, El Matador, which means the killer. He panics and he runs across the Santa Ana freeway where he tries to carjack a car. He drags a woman out of this car and all the public come to her aid and they're like, they start chasing this guy. Apparently whilst he's sitting in the car, people are sort of like looking at him and he's shouting, don't come any closer, I've got a gun. And this one guy thinks like, I can't see a gun. And so literally goes up, opens a car door and just pulls Richard out and Richard just starts to run again. He's literally running as you see in TV shows in cartoons. He's fence hopping through people's gardens and the word is spreading. Like everyone in this area was very close knit and everyone was whispering to each other. Like there's this guy, he's on the run. We think he's the night stalker. And as he runs through one garden, a guy literally starts attacking him with barbecue utensils. Citizens of LA are literally reporting him to the police. Like every movement he makes, the police like are chasing him. And Richard is literally being chased by an angry mob. Like he's being chased through the streets. And eventually they catch up with him and they beat the crap out of him. Like this one guy's got a metal rod and is literally like beating him to the ground with it. And at the scene, Richard actually had to be treated by paramedics because he was pretty injured. The first police officer to arrive at the scene was 25 year old Andy Ramirez, who was no relation to him. Um, and he was called to the scene, not knowing that it was the Night Stalker. He basically got a call saying that there were men fighting, there was a possible gun or a knife at the 2700 block of Hubbard Street. And Andy was like literally only around the corner, he was like 30 seconds away, so he responds to the call and says, yep, I'll go. And when he arrives, he can like see this group of really, really angry men. And Richard Ramirez is sat on a curb, like being held there. He's waved down by a few men, one of these men is literally holding like a bloody metal pipe. And Ramirez is sat there with blood all over him, he's got a big gash in his forehead, he's covered in sweat. And Andy doesn't immediately like click that it's the Night Stalker, he doesn't recognise Ramirez from all the pictures, but he knows that this guy must have done something pretty pretty awful for all of these guys to so blatantly beat him. So Andy asks Richard his name and he replies Ricardo Ramirez and it still didn't click for him who this man was and it was only when Jim Kaiser comes on the scene. Now Jim Kaiser is the one who was actually like chasing the report of the Night Stalker. Does Andy realise who this guy is? So Jim puts Richard in the police car and drives him to the police station whilst Andy remains at the scene trying to calm the crowds, get their stories and secure the crime scene. And Richard has no fight left in him by this point. He sat in the back of the car and he says, I'm going to be blamed for all of those murders. And over the radio, Jim says, bingo, we got him. Once they get to the police station, Richard gets out of the car and immediately throws up in the car park. And he says to Jim, put a bullet in my head. 
let's end it. Detectives who questioned Ramirez said that he was the most vicious and vile person they'd ever come across. He showed absolutely no remorse for any of his crimes. They are desires whereas if, whereas I didn't give in to them, I would be crushed by them. I believe in the, in the evil in human nature. This is a wicked, wicked world. And uh, in a wicked world, you, wicked people are born. They said his eyes were black and he had like literally no soul or emotion in them. It was like looking into a black hole. And apparently Richard sat there being questioned and the entire time was like tracing circles and lines on the table. He was drawing pentagrams. And the trial that followed at this time was the most expensive trial in US history. It went on for four years and cost $1.8 million, which is equivalent to about $3.5 million nowadays. The only trial that's ever been more expensive than it is the OJ Simpson trial in 94. Richard confessed everything to begin with, but later actually withdrew all this, saying it was a case of mistaken identity. And he did everything he could to delay the start of this trial. Like, he was messing around constantly. I mean, his trial was complicated enough as it is. All of his felonies happened in sort of different counties. They had to bring together all of these different police stations to try and work through all of their evidence. But Richard was like removing people from his legal team, like firing them, getting new people and then firing them. He was just trying to mess with it. Over three years after he was first arrested, so we're looking at July 1988 now, the jury selection process begins. So already this has taken three years and over 1600 potential jurors had to be interviewed because they had to find somebody who could be non-biased, who hadn't really been keeping up with the story. And that was hard. Eventually they managed to narrow it down to 24 people, so 12 jurors and 12 alternates. And the following court case lasted over a year, just due to the sheer amount of evidence that had to be shown. Richard was really destructive throughout all the trials and he never once showed an ounce of remorse for anything. Even whilst his victims were like up on the stand, he would sit there and laugh. On his first court appearance, he famously raised his hand where he had a pentagram drawn on it and he yelled, Hail Satan. He wore black sunglasses and he would throw two finger devil signs to all of his satanic supporters who were in the courtroom with him. On the 3rd of August, the Los Angeles Times reports that some jail employees overheard that Richard was planning on smuggling a gun into the courtroom and shooting the prosecutor. And of course, after this, they had to dial up all of the security hugely. So people had to be like x-rayed before they entered, everyone was searched. And of course, he never ended up getting a gun into the courtroom, whether this was truth or just a rumor, we'll never really know. However, on the 14th of August, one juror, Phyllis Singletary, is actually found dead in her apartment. She'd been shot and everyone was left wondering if Richard was responsible for this. However, it later turned out to be a domestic incident. Her boyfriend had shot her and he'd later committed suicide in a hotel. But the juror who actually replaced Phyllis was so, so scared that she wouldn't even go to her own home at night. She thought the same fate was going to follow her. And as often happens in these serial killer cases, it didn't take long for Ramirez to attract a following of loyal fans. Other Satanists revered his every single move and they would actually come to the courtroom to see him. And this was alongside the woman who would actually line up outside the courtroom just to get a glimpse of him. Despite his crimes and his teeth, Richard was actually a fairly good looking guy. And people were obsessed with him. And this phenomenon is something actually seen with other serial killers, Ted Bundy, for example, and even to an extent with Jeffrey Dahmer. And it's called hyperistophilia and it's believed that women and sometimes men believe that they can fall in love with these men and change them and just give them the nurturing and the love that they need. It's about wanting to fix them. One of the jurors was also obsessed with him. This was Cindy Hayden and she was just enamored with him. She was originally a substitute and then eventually had to enter the main jury. And Richard was well aware of the influence he had over her. He would make intense eye contact with her as she sat on the stools and he would even winger her and sort of try and talk to her and she was just in love. On Valentine's Day, she even sent some cupcakes with I love you written on top in icing. And of course, she was pretty soon dismissed from the jury herself. But one woman caught Richard's eye more than the rest. This was Doreen Leoy. She was a freelance teen magazine editor and a self-described Catholic virgin from San Rafael. 
she was obsessed with him. She said that as soon as she saw his photo in the paper, she was in love. She felt he needed a friend and so wrote to him 75 times before they eventually met and she stood by him throughout everything. They met even before the court case even began and she was fiercely protective over him and she always stood by his side saying that he was innocent and that he was framed. She believed everything he said to her. Richard proposed to her in 1988 and they actually wed eight years later in 96 and she bought a gold wedding band for herself and a platinum wedding band for him because according to him, Satanists don't wear gold. In a 1997 interview, Dorian actually insists that he's innocent and that he's not capable of what he was accused and he's a kind and loving individual. And she said that when he was eventually put to death, she would commit suicide. There are many who would look at Richard Ramirez in the eye and say, he is the, the face of evil. Mm -hmm. And yet you look at him and, and you see the man of your dreams. Yeah. Who needs glasses here? <laughs> I can't help the way the world looks at him. They don't know him the way I do. However, they actually split in 2009. Some sources say they split because it was just too difficult for them. And other sources say that she finally cracked. She saw the DNA evidence linking him to the murder of nine-year-old Mei Lung and she finally broke up with him. She said that she didn't believe him anymore. And finally, on September 20th, 1989, nearly four years after his arrest, Richard Ramirez is found guilty and convicted of all charges. 13 counts of murder, five attempted murder, 11 sexual assaults and 14 burglary charges. After he left the courthouse, he gives the press a one word comment and that word is evil. On the 7th of November, he receives 19 death sentences to which he responds, no big deal, death always comes with the territory. I'll see you in Disneyland. Why on earth would you have hurt those people? Why did you kill those people? Uh, no comments, no comments. I, I cannot answer it at this time. After sentencing, he was transferred to death row at California's San Quentin State Prison, where he was to be put to death in the gas chamber. I didn't even know that that was a thing, gas chamber death sentences, but apparently it is, and I find that quite shocking. Um, but of course, being put to death is a very slow process and Richard actually spent nearly 24 years on death row. In 2006, he started his first round of appeals, which was obviously unsuccessful. And right up until his death, he always had appeals pending, but obviously he died before any of them could go through. These appeals would take so long because his trial records were nearly 50,000 pages long. These people, like looking at his appeals, had to read 50,000 pages worth of trial records. In the end, it wasn't the gas chamber that got him and by all estimates, he probably would have been in his 70s by the time they eventually put him to death. He died on June 7th, 2013 due to complications from B cell lymphoma. Cancer got him and he also had other complications due to his heavy drug use throughout his life and the fact that he had hepatitis C. And that is a story of Richard Ramirez who I personally think is the most terrifying serial killer of all time. He was completely devoid of any emotion, he never showed any sorrow, he killed because he wanted to. Everything he did was a media circus, he wanted his name out there and he wanted people to know how evil he was. A serial killer comes about by circumstances and like a, a recipe, poverty, drugs, child abuse. These things, it, it, you know, are, contribute to a person, uh, to a person's frustration and anger and, uh, and uh, at some point in life, he explodes. Let me know all of your thoughts and feelings about Ramirez down below and let me know who you'd want to see in next month's Serial Killer Spotlight video and I will see you in my next one. Bye guys.